If you have your Bibles with you one more time this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the New Testament book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, you'll find it on page 1195. If you're a guest with us, we've been studying through the book of Romans, and uh, Lord willing, we'll finish uh, chapter 1 this morning, Romans chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 18 to read it all in its proper context. And I want to speak for a few minutes on this subject, the truth exchanged for a lie. Romans chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 18. And this is what the Word of God says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. In her book, Gender Ideology, What Do Christians Need to Know?, Sharon James tells the story of Ryland Whittington. Ryland was born in California in 2007. Her parents were thrilled to have a lovely, healthy little girl. But they claimed that as soon as their daughter could talk, she said she wanted to be a boy. And so they concluded that she was transgender. So they cut her hair, dressed her as a boy, and always used masculine pronouns such as he and his. And when Ryland was only six, they took her to a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender diversity event. The child was put on the platform where she told the audience, My name is Ryland Michael Whittington. I'm a transgender kid. I am six years old. I am a cool kid. And I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. Our world is filled with stories like this one. Stories that seemingly, according to the families and those taking part, begin with happiness, but end in tragedy, with irreversible consequences of attempting to transform the biological sex of one gender to another. And through a planned and coordinated agenda of preying on the most vulnerable 
of our society, our children, adults, activists, politicians, media outlets, and others are wreaking havoc on God-given societal norms. And all of this evidence points to the deep confusion and brokenness that has engulfed humanity. Which brings us this morning to our text. The passage before us is foundational to our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and our understanding of the world in which we live. It is doubtful if there is a more perceptive analysis of human nature than this passage before us in the book of Romans. Its sin, guilt, and judgment are on full display. And beginning in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, all the way through Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul outlines in detail the nature of sin and its consequences, reminding us that apart from the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of humanity stands condemned under the righteous wrath of a holy God. And in these verses, Paul awakens us to the fact that we not only need to be saved from our sins, we need to be saved from God himself. As Andrew David Nassali writes, we need Christ's saving righteousness because we are unrighteous and we deserve his judging righteousness. And so in verses 24 to 32... Paul explains how the present day manifestation of God's wrath is being revealed because humanity has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So would you notice with me three truths this morning? First of all, in verse 24, I want you to see the releasing of God's wrath. Paul writes, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And you'll notice he begins this section with the word therefore. And this word refers us back to all the reasons that Paul has been giving us from verse 18 all the way down to verse 23. That although God revealed himself to man in verses 19 and 20, man rejected God in verse 21. And then rationalized his rejection of God in verse 22. And created substitute gods of his own making in verse 23. And because man abandoned God, God abandoned man. And the phrase that Paul uses to describe this releasing of God's wrath on humanity is the phrase, God gave them up. It's used three times in this passage, in verse 24, in verse 26, and in verse 28. And it is intense language that describes judicial abandonment. And this judicial abandonment contains two aspects. First of all, it is permissive. It means that God withdraws his divine restraint on men's hearts and permits them to have their own way. He relinquishes his hold over them and he ceases to curb their willful determination to sin. He permits them to sin and go their own way. And the second aspect is positive. God doesn't just simply let them go. He also positively consigns them to suffer the consequences of their sin. It's not merely divine relinquishment. It is divine retribution. As Douglas Moo points out, God does not simply let the boat go. He pushes the boat downstream and like a judge who hands over a prisoner to the punishment of the crime he has earned God hands the sinner over to ever increasing sin and judgment he doesn't just release them to sin 
he pushes them further downstream into their sin. And when God lets go of an individual who refuses to have him as his God, that person will continue to sink deeper and deeper into a wicked and wayward lifestyle, one that will only bring great harm to themselves and to those around them. And such an act by God toward a person leaves him completely helpless against the darkness of his own heart. And friends, when this happens to an individual, great spiritual and moral and physical problems compound, just like we're seeing all throughout our world today. And so as a result, we should not think of the dismantling of God-given ethical boundaries as a distinguishing mark of progress in our nation and in our world as many in the media and leadership of our nation would like for us to perceive. Rather, we should see it for what it is biblically. It is evidence of God's judicial abandonment on the world. In essence, God says to sinners who reject the light of His general revelation, since you will not have me, I will let you go down the path of your own choosing, the path of destruction. You want your sins, God says to us. Your sins you can have with all of their dreadful ramifications and consequences. And friends, the Apostle Paul gave a similar message and warning in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Listen to how he begins these verses. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. It is a warning. It is a command. What are we not to be deceived about? God is not mocked. Don't be deceived by that. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. When you reject God and choose to go your own way, He will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. Notice in verses 24, 26, and 28 that God gave them up to three specific escalating acts of judgment. And it's also important to note that the behaviors that Paul describes are not the root of the problem. They're the result of the exchange of verse 23 where sinful humanity exchanges the truth of God for a lie. And Paul is teaching us that because we do not love God, all of our loves become disordered. And when we suppress the truth and exchange the truth for a lie, God hands us over to all of our disordered desires in every single area of our lives. And this judicial judgment and abandonment that Paul is describing in verse 24 is a foretaste of the ultimate judicial judgment and abandonment that will take place in the future at final judgment. Paul described a little bit of what this final judicial abandonment would look like to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse, verses 10 to 12. And leading into those verses, he described how in the end times when the Antichrist is revealed and sets up his throne and demands worldwide worship, that God will once and for all judicially abandon those who have rejected him. And this is what Paul writes. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Did you hear that? 
They refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is God's ultimate judicial judgment and abandonment on sinful humanity because they refuse to love God, they refuse to believe the truth about God, and they rejected him and exchanged his truth for a lie. Now, friends, in this powerful verse, Paul teaches us that God gives the ungodly and the unrighteous exactly what they want. And when they obtain what they want, they find instead of being free, their unhindered desires keep them bound, restless, and empty. And their endless quest for satisfaction end in their misery. And I ask you this morning, does this describe your life? Does this describe the way you're living? That you're rejecting God and you've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And you're determining to go your own way apart from God, thinking that you will be fulfilled and satisfied when in the very moments of this service this morning, you find yourself empty and detached and abandoned. Thinking that you would be fulfilled with everything that you've pursued. You're restless and empty. Can you not see this morning, friends? That this is God's judgment on your life. And the good news of the gospel through this passage is that Paul doesn't just identify your problem. He gives you the solution. That instead of suppressing the truth of God. And instead of exchanging truths for lies. You would turn from your lies and turn to the truth. And cast your heart and your soul and your very life. On the Lord Jesus Christ, who would truly set you free and reorder your desires and your life for what is good and true and right. For whomever the Son sets free, he is free indeed. You don't have to live bound up anymore. You can be set free in Christ. Well, we not only see the releasing of God's wrath. Secondly, in verses 24 to 31, Paul describes the results of God's wrath. And in the releasing of his wrath, Paul says in verses 24 and 25 that God first gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Do you see that? And the word lust that he uses literally means over-desire. It is describing an all-controlling drive and longing. William Barclay, in his commentary, defines lust as the passionate desire for forbidden pleasure. It is the desire which makes me do nameless and shameless things. It's the way of life of a man who has become so completely immersed in the world that he has ceased to be aware of God at all. He is over-desired. Now look at the text carefully, friends. This is the very wrath of God. To give us what we want to much to give us over to the pursuit of the things that we have put in place of him that the worst thing god can do to human beings is the present in the present is to let them reach their idolatrous goals his judgment is to give us over to the destructive power of idolatry and evil that we long for and desire and Paul says in verse 24 that this over-desire for our impurities, it manifests itself in the dishonoring of our bodies among ourselves. He's describing how when God gets us free to our over-desires for impurity, that we treat ourselves 
without dignity, that we treat ourselves as way of an insult, that we treat ourselves in disgrace and dishonor. And look at the text carefully. He doesn't just give us over to this, to this dishonor of ourselves and of our bodies. He gives us over to this dishonor and we dishonor others through our lusts and through our impurities. And instead of living in dignity, those who reject God show dishonor to themselves and they show dishonor to others through their impurity. And all of this is sowing seeds of lasting psychological, social, and physical consequences. Can you not see that with your own eyes this morning in the world around you? And it begs the question, why did God give them up in this way? Well, notice carefully in your Bible that verse 24 describing this sexual sin is located between verse 23 and verse 25. Are you aware of that? Makes sense, doesn't it? 23, 24, 25. And it's right in the middle. And you say, well, why are you pointing that out, Pastor? I can count. Well, yes, I know you can count. You're smart people. But look at verse 23 and look at verse 25 and look at the bookends. And what is he talking about in verse 23 and in verse 25? He's talking about idolatry. And Paul says in verse 25 that God gave them up in the lust of their hearts and the dishonoring of their bodies because of their idolatry. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. See, this has been his thesis statement all the way through this passage of Scripture. When you reject God and you suppress the truth about God and you exchange it for a lie and you believe the lies instead of the truth, you become engaged in idolatry. And your idolatry leads you to your immorality. They're succinctly connected. And you begin to worship yourself and you begin to worship the creature, Paul says, rather than the creator. And notice what he says about the creator. This creator is God and he is to be blessed and worshipped and honored and served forever. And then Paul puts an exclamation on it. Amen. So be it. Let it be. It is fixed. This one true God that sinful humanity is suppressing and exchanging the truth for lies. He is the one who is to be worshipped. He is the one who is to be served. And this is fixed. It is fixed. It is settled. It is a point of fact and reality. And all of the world is moving, hurling to this truth. That he will be worshipped. So Paul reminds us in these verses that it is a short distance from idolatry to immorality. If you get the doctrine of God wrong, you'll get the doctrine of life wrong. For when God is rejected, you remember what he said in verse 23? He is replaced. And as Paul has shown us, the first thing that replaces him is ourselves. And then anything that we desire, we become our own gods. And we fulfill all of our desires. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If you are your own God, then you can practice the lust of your heart, no matter how impure it is, without fear or judgment. Because you're God. And yet Paul says, all the while you're doing this, you don't realize you are being judged this very moment, God is abandoning you and giving you up to your over desires and to disorder. And the only way we can escape from this downward spiral of immorality is to stop suppressing the truth, to honor God as God, to worship him, to trust him, to depend upon him, to submit to him, and to desire him more than anything else that he has made. You'll notice in the releasing of his wrath, Paul says that God not only gave them up to impurity, 
Look at verses 26 and 27. God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And at the end of verse 26 and in verse 27, Paul defines these dishonorable passions as the exchange of natural relations between men and women for those that are contrary to nature. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say. All of the debates about whether homosexual behavior is acquired or inherently genetic are answered right here in these two verses. Paul clearly, clearly and unmistakably states that homosexuality is against nature as God has created it. Case closed. You either believe the truth about the Bible on this issue or you suppress it. But God is not cloudy. He's clear. As one writer said, all people are born in sin. And individuals have varying tendencies and temptations towards certain sins. But no one is born a homosexual. Any more than anyone is born a thief or a murderer. A person who becomes a habitual and unrepentant thief, murderer, adulterer, or homosexual does so of their own choice. End quote. It is clear. And Paul tells us to go against nature is to go against God. And it is to go against God's good design. That means that homosexuality, transgender, and all other gender identity issues are not fluid cultural matters. They are unchanging creation matters. They are timeless. And God is infinitely good and wise and His designs are the best and they are for our good and they are for human flourishing. Furthermore, because God created humankind male and female, God instituted marriage as a heterosexual union, and what God has established, no one has the liberty to alter, no matter how loving the relationship may be. Jesus said it himself in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Friends, this is established biblical truth and you're going to have to decide whether you believe the bible or you reject it but god is abundantly clear now look at the end of verse 27 paul says that homosexuality consumes the sinner engaged in it it consumes them they're given over to all of these passions and it consumes them. And he describes it as a shameless act that merits disgrace, not acceptance. And he describes it as an error that is deserving of due penalty. It, that language describes penalties that are given for idol worship. And can't you trace the argument that Paul is making here? You reject God, you suppress the truth about him, you replace him with idols that begin with yourself and then all of your over-desires, which leads you to impurity and the dishonoring of your body and being given over to all of these uncontrolled passions that are full of error and they're shameless acts and you no longer 
blush about them anymore. You promote them on full display, and it's this downward spiral all the way down. And it's worthy of penalty and judgment. It consumes you. And God gives you over to it. Now, I want you to know this morning that while the sin of homosexuality is repeatedly condemned in Scripture, it must not be treated any differently than pornography addiction, than fornication, living together outside of God's bounds for marriage. Friends, the world says that that's okay. You've got to live with someone before you marry them to make sure it's right. And would you hear the word of God this morning? That's a lie. You're exchanging the truth of God for lies. Living together before marriage is sin. Somebody has to stand up and say that. It's not cloudy. But you've been deceived. And I'll tell you again this morning, God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. It's clear. When you break the bounds of marriage, whether it's in transgender issues, homosexuality, pornography addiction, living together outside of the bounds of marriage, premarital sex, when you do all of these things, you are tarnishing the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. This is not a small issue. It's a creation issue. It's a gospel issue. And there must be clarity in the church. There must be. I also want you to hear this morning that the Bible is clear that active homosexual acts as a settled, unrepentant pattern of behavior is indicative of people who are outside of the kingdom of God. I also want you to know this morning, any of these other sexual sins that are an unrepentant pattern of behavior are also indications that you are outside of the kingdom of God. You can't just kick the ball towards homosexuality and transgender, friends, and ignore your own sin. That is the height of hypocrisy. Now listen carefully to the Apostle Paul's words to the Corinthians who were a completely messed up church and had all kinds of sins in it. And this is what he said. And I want you to know it's clear. It's not cloudy. Or do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, by the way, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do you hear it again? Do not be deceived. Why does the Bible keep telling us not to be deceived? Can you answer that? Because we're deceived. And so he keeps reminding us, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived about what? Listen to what he says. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Did you hear it? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is he describing? A unrepentant pattern of behavior. And did he describe homosexuality in those verses? Yes, he did. But he also described drunkards. He also described the greedy. And do you see how you can't pick and choose the sins that you're comfortable uh, casting judgment on and ignoring the others? Because you will always cast judgment on the sins that you're not doing. So all of those sins as an unrepentant pattern of behavior describe a person that's not on their way to heaven. Now listen to how the passage ends. And such were some of you. But you were washed. 
You were sanctified. You were set apart. You were made clean. You were made holy. And you were justified just as if you never committed homosexuality. Just as if you never stole. Just as if you never got drunk. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And see, when you say that you can practice and live in homosexuality and adultery and thievery and drunkenness and all of these other sins, do you understand what you're saying? It's a gospel issue. You're saying that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for your sins isn't powerful enough to rescue you. And Paul is saying it clearly is. That this is what your life used to look like. But when you heard of the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, He washed you. He set you apart. He made you look like His Son Jesus. And you're accepted by God. You're loved and you're welcomed in. That's the difference. That's the difference. So homosexuality is contrary to the created order. It is contrary to the word of God. It is contrary to the will of God. It is contrary to God's ways for men and women to live. Homosexuality is unnecessary. It is a result of exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And it is an example of the releasing of the wrath of God on humanity. That is the truth. Now notice. In the releasing of his wrath, Paul says that God not only gave them up to impurity and to dishonorable passions. Look at verses 28 to 31. God gave them up to a debased mind. This phrase, debased mind, it's used for the discarding of impure metals. And it came to include the ideas of worthlessness and uselessness. It describes a mind that fails the test, that fails the test of what God approves. It's a mind that can no longer form sound judgments intellectually, morally, and spiritually. God's wrath is revealed in such a way that sinful humanity no longer has a functioning mind. That's why when you say to yourself, when you're encountered with certain things in the world, how can they think like that? How can they say that? How can they do that? Verses 28 to 31, God gave them up in their mind. He gave them over to debase the very lowest level of thinking possible. That's why they can no longer discern whether they're a man or a woman. So they make a whole new classification for themselves. And then they develop a whole set of terminology with pronouns. And the end result of all of that is it confuses and brings chaos on all of society. You don't know how to approach someone. You don't know how to talk to someone. Why? Because it's been brought to the lowest debase level of humanity. This is where unrestrained sin leads you. Now notice, Paul goes on in these verses to say that their debased mind led to a whole variety of sins which ought not to be done and which all taken together describe the breakdown of human relationships as standards disappear and society completely disintegrates. It leads us to the moral chaos and free-for-all of a world that is full of economic disaster, social disaster, family disaster, relational disaster, and all of it is a tangible sign of the releasing of the wrath of God on humanity and our world. And notice what he does in verses 29 to 31. He names 21 specific sins. And the list of sins that he gives is overwhelming and comprehensive. Additionally, at the beginning of verse 29 and in the middle of verse 29, Paul says that they don't merely engage in all of these actions. Look at what the text says. They are being filled with all manner of unrighteousness and they are full of these sins. It means that their lives are thoroughly characterized and overflowing 
with these 21 sins that he describes. And you can break them down into four groups. Look at verse 29. Unrighteousness leads to evil, which leads to covetousness, which leads to malice. At the end of verse 29, it begins with envy. It goes to murder, strife, deceit, and maliciousness. At the end of verse 29 into 30, it begins with gossip, and it moves to slander. And then you become haters of God, and insolent, and haughty, and boastful, and inventors of evil. And look at the last one disobedient to parents. And then verse 31, you're foolish, which leads you to faithless and heartless and ultimately ruthless. And I would submit to you this morning, there's not a single person in this room that can't find themselves in something of that list of 21. And it is all evidence of the releasing of the wrath of God. Now, I have several applications for this long part of the sermon. Here's the first one. I want to speak to believers. When you read these verses, how do you respond? Do you shake your head and roll your eyes in self-righteous thinking about what others are like? Do you sit there in your seat as the pastor confronts the sins of the day and homosexuality and transgender issues? Yes, that's right. Go get him, pastor. Go get him. Go get him. They need to hear it. And never stop and say, you need to hear it. I need to hear it. Or do you pause this morning and consider whether or not you are guilty of idolatry and disordered worship? and sinful behavior, and self-righteousness. Idolatry doesn't just lead you to homosexuality, friends. Idolatry leads you to fornication. It leads you to greed. It leads you to gossip and slander. So how do you respond, believer, when you read these verses? Secondly, I'm going to speak to the unbelievers in the room. And I want to ask you this morning, unbeliever, do you see where sin will ultimately lead you? Do you see through these verses that you not only need to be saved from these sins that are listed in this passage, but you need to be saved from the wrath of God? That this very moment, the wrath of God is on your life for your sin. Would you not turn from your sin, unbeliever, and turn to Christ today and be saved? Application number three, to the parents and grandparents who may have children and grandchildren swept up in the sins of homosexuality and transgender idolatry, would you believe the gospel for the pain that's in your heart? Would you believe this morning that if God could save you, God could save your child and your grandchild. Would you remain steadfast and uncompromising in the truth of God's word, never sacrificing or suppressing the truth for the sake of your child or your grandchild? As painful as it is to hear, you must give first allegiance to God. You cannot suppress the truth for the sake of your child or your grandchild. And I would say to you this morning, if you don't tell them the truth, who will? Who will? And would you love them? Would you pray for them? Would you never give up on them? And would you believe that their sin, oh, listen to this, would you believe that their sin is a choice and it's not a reflection of you And how well you parented. It is a choice that they're making. And would you believe this morning that there is hope for your family in Jesus Christ? Would you believe those things today? They're true. They're all true. 
And finally, ah, two more. (laughs) I miscounted. Number four. To those who may be contemplating or currently living in homosexuality or transgender sins, would you see this morning that you have been deceived? Would you see that your sin will never bring you lasting joy and peace? Would you see that at this moment, God's wrath is being revealed to you and released onto you? And unless you turn from your sin in repentance and turn to Christ, you remain on a collision course with the final, full manifestation of God's wrath for your sin for all eternity in a literal place called hell. Finally, number five, students, teenagers, college students. Would you, if you've tuned out, I don't think you have, but just in case you have, would you tune back in and would you listen to your pastor for a moment? Students, would you refuse to be deceived by the lies of the world regarding your gender and your sexuality? Would you refuse to be deceived? And would you unashamedly believe and embrace the truth of God's word? And would you, students, be an apologist for this truth in your generation? Would you stand up and go against the tide in your generation? Would you stand firm on the conviction of God's word about these issues, no matter what it costs you? That's what's going to turn the ship around. Embracing the truth, believing it, not compromising and living it out. Students, would you do that? Would you be G.I. Joes for the kingdom of God? Well, Paul not only describes the releasing of God's wrath and the results of God's wrath, Finally, he describes the reaction to God's wrath in verse 32. They know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, and they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Do you see this verse, friends? This is how sinful humanity reacts to the wrath of God. They don't stop doing their sin. They continue to do their sin, and they approve of others who do it as well. And Paul says, they deserve to die for all of these things that they are doing, and they don't care. They don't care because they're their own God. And they think they won't be judged. The prophet Isaiah warned of this condition in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So they do all of these things that Paul has listed in verses 24 to 31, and then they give approval to others who do them as well. And friends, that's how you know You've reached the bottom of society. When you're no longer embarrassed of your sin, you live it right out in the open. You're no longer embarrassed of your rejection of God. You're no longer embarrassed of your hatred of God. And you encourage others, even the most vulnerable of our society, to follow your actions. And when that happens, unnatural, disordered, Moral chaos is the norm. And this is our world. John Murray, who has one of the best commentaries on Romans, said it this way. To put it bluntly, we are not only bent on damning ourselves, but we congratulate others in doing the same things that will damn them. Everybody wants to be a part of the party. So just come on in. There's nothing to worry about. And as a result, we're under the wrath of God. So how should we respond 
to this passage. Pastor, you preached three sermons on this passage. How are we to respond? Well, I think Paul would want us to understand this morning the beauty of the world that we live in. It's not an accident. God created it. God spoke it into existence. And he did it so that it would testify of him, his eternal power, and his divine nature. These words also remind us not only of the beauty of the world we live in, but of the brokenness of the world that we live in. And so we take the beauty and the brokenness, and we run to the only place where beauty and brokenness can meet, the cross of Christ, and find grace and mercy and love in the beauty and in the broken. And that's what we should do with these verses. Secondly, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you know that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven, that you've trusted Christ to be your Savior, you've turned from your sins, you've believed on Jesus, then you should read these verses in light of verses 16 and 17. The power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so powerful. You don't have to worry about the wrath of God because God's Son took wrath in your place. Finally, we need to ask what idols could be or are jostling for position in our heart and life. That what other, what other than God has become the master of our lives? Parents, have you considered this morning whether or not you are encouraging and leading your children to make idols for themselves through their grades in school, through sports, through dance, through cheerleading, through any other activities? Have you considered whether you're allowing their disobedience to you to go unchecked? It's all a form of idolatry. Have you allowed gossip to go unchallenged? Slander, malice. What have we allowed to take root in our lives? This passage of Scripture gives clarity to all that we're witnessing around us. The moral depravity and the social decay of our world is a result of the wrath and judgment of God. I am confident in that, friends. It's just like the days of Noah. When the wrath of God was poured out on all of humanity. But just like in the days of Noah, God provided an ark for Noah and his family to be saved from wrath and judgment. God has provided an ark for you and me and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll turn from your sin and confess it to God and believe on Christ as Lord and Savior, you'll be saved. You'll have an ark of safety and rescue. For the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, you don't have to stay in your brokenness today. You don't have to stay in your emptiness today. You don't have to stay bound up today. You can run to the ark of Jesus Christ and be saved. And whom he saves will be set free. Oh, don't, train, don't change the truth of God for a lie. You do it to your detriment. Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you today for these sobering truths. We thank you that you love us enough to tell them. We thank you that you love us enough to help us understand the world in which we're living. And we thank you that you love us enough to show us a way out. And so wherever we find ourselves today, God, I pray that we would look to you. You are where our help comes from. So would you save those today who don't know you? Would you rescue those who are struggling with besetting sin? Would you draw those who are at a distance from you back into close fellowship? Would you strengthen the resolve of those who know you? And would you build your church and your people for your glory? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.